So Peter's going to cover a little bit of lessons from Japan. Okay, so how many of you were here in Warrington about two years ago when Japan's earthquake happened? Okay. Yeah, there was a little bit of panic. Some of it warranted and some of it probably not. Uh, so let's talk about that. We are actually a geologic mirror image of Japan. We have a subduction zone off our coast, as Rachel says, and they've got one just off their coast with this rupture zone shown in green. Uh, the extra disadvantage that Japan has is that their water off the coast is much deeper, so it generates even larger tsunami waves. This is a uh, shake map comparison between Japan on the left and Oregon on the right. Uh, on the left is actually what happened in Japan back in March 2011, showing the amount of shaking with the greatest amount of shaking in red and less to the west in the cooler colors. And on the right is a simulated uh, magnitude 9 Cascadia earthquake for Oregon, showing, as you can see in red, a lot of shaking up and down the coast. It dissipates as it goes inland. But even here in the Willamette Valley, you can see that uh, there are areas, oops, there we go. There are areas of pretty heavy shaking even in the Willamette Valley, and part of that is due to our sandy soils, which move around quite a bit in an earthquake. In Japan, the ground shook for three minutes. Uh, we can expect uh, two to five minutes of shaking here in Oregon. And you can see that um, the ground shook for a good long while. This is a neat image from NOAA of the Pacific Ocean showing the energy released by that tsunami in Japan with the greatest amount of energy in the dark purples here and spreading across the Pacific with its tentacles of tsunami waves. And this is interesting, huh? Poor Crescent City, California. Because of the shape of the ocean floor, they typically get these bigger tsunamis. This is an image uh, in Japan. You can see one of the river valleys and how tsunami waves really travel far up these valleys, which means that rivers, creeks, and sloughs are danger zones. It's not just the beaches. Um, the tsunami will really just follow the path of least resistance, and you can see that here with all the damage. What's on top of the building? That's a boat. And I've seen photos of even larger boats, uh, ships really, that came inland with the tsunami surges. And I say surges because the tsunami is not one wave, but a series of waves, right? That's right. In Japan, their defenses failed. They had uh, pine forests planted, they had seawalls, which were overtopped. The infrastructure failed. In some areas, the waves uh, reached about 40 feet, even higher in other areas. Railroads became unusable, and bridges got washed away. We have a lot of bridges in Oregon that we can expect to uh, either collapse or not be safe to drive over after the Cascadia earthquake. That's why we tell folks to practice their evacuation route on foot. A last resort in a tsunami, if you're far away from high ground or you can't make it in time, is what we call vertical evacuation. Um, again, you can see these tentacles of tsunami energy traveling up the rivers and creeks. This right here was their disaster management headquarters in the inundation zone. And in that city, 31 out of the 80 evacuation centers were destroyed. So they really just underestimated the amount of inundation that could happen. In this case, 30 officials went to the roof and only 11 survived. This is a very tough photo to look at. So uh, how do buildings fare in tsunamis? Wood buildings do not do well at all. They simply get uh, washed away by the speed and the force of the water. Um, but concrete, uh, reinforced concrete buildings do much better, but not in every case. You can see here just a wasteland of tsunami destruction with uh, some concrete buildings still standing and others just pushed right over. So debris is really the killer, right? We're not talking just about a flooding event. A tsunami is actually this huge uh, set of energy carrying pieces of houses, carrying cars, carrying ships and boats. Um, a lot of debris. How many of you, when it was playing up here at Seaside, saw the Hollywood film called The Impossible? Anybody? <coughs> Just one or two, okay. 
This was an Oscar-nominated film about the family in Southeast Asia back in 2004 who survived the tsunami there that took 230,000 lives. And it's really an amazing film because it follows mostly the story of the mother who got caught up in the tsunami with her son and how she was injured so badly by this debris and finally made her way to a hospital and was treated and survived. This is an aerial image of Sendai, Japan, before the tsunami with farmland at the west and buildings and forest areas to the right and after the tsunami. So we have a, a terrific little newsletter called Cascadia on the back table there. It has more information, um, a lot of good science information and anecdotal information about the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. You can pick one up and read a little bit more about it. So in Oregon, we can expect something very similar to what Japan saw. With a magnitude 9 earthquake, um, we'll see violent shaking for two or more minutes. It's going to be unmistakable. You will have no doubt when it begins. Bridges will fail. Uh, you'll want to walk to high ground, as I say. And 15 to 30 minutes after the earthquake is the first series of waves coming on shore, depending where you are. We use that number because it's the simplest to remember, and it's the shortest amount of time that you can expect to see tsunami waves. But there are parts of the coast, and we'll talk about this more, say river towns that are farther up river, or Astoria, which is around the bend of the Columbia there, which have a little more time because the tsunami has to wrap around those bays and estuaries to work its way up. Tsunami waves will continue for at least four hours, but we tell folks to stay on high ground and wait for uh, a signal for local emergency officials before going back into the inundation zone. Because again, multiple series of waves, and the first may not be the biggest. So to learn these tough lessons from Japan, which is really a gift to us, um, since it happened so recently and it's still fresh in our minds somewhat, you really want to prepare an evacuation plan and your bag of emergency supplies, your grab-and-go kit. When the ground shakes, get to high ground as quick as you can on foot. If you have no other choice, you can consider vertical evacuation in a tall building, concrete building. Some areas actually have earthen berms uh, that they've constructed where there's no other safe place to get to high ground. Uh, tsunami waves will arrive for several hours, wood buildings will not be safe, and it could be several to many, many days before help arrives. Coastal towns are going to be cut off by bridges failing, and so there's going to be a lot of island communities here on the coast where we need to really look out for each other at the neighborhood level, and um, that's, that's why programs like CERT and Matthew Neighborhood are just so important. And the good news, finally, is just that it's, it's a simple one. It's really that if you do a few simple steps, you can easily survive and take action from the earthquake. Now, in the earthquake, uh, <clears throat> in terms of what to do, uh, depending where you are when it happens, you're not likely to be you know, standing at your kitchen sink. You could be driving on Highway 101 someplace. So if you're indoors, drop cover and hold on, take cover. If you're in bed, uh, do the same, but cover your head with a pillow. I've also heard some folks say they would like to get actually on the floor and pull the mattress over their body. I think that's what I'm planning to do. Uh, if you're outdoors, get to a clear area if you can do so safely and stay away from hazards overhead like power lines, telephone poles, trees, and so on. <coughs> if you're driving, pull over to the side of the road, stop, turn on your emergency brake, and uh, stay away from objects above and just wait for the shaking to pass. If you're at the beach, uh, do the usual drop, cover, and hold, but um, get to high ground as soon as you can. Uh, we say here to estimate how long the shaping lasts, but you know, really, like you say, it's got to be an unmistakable experience, and when that shaking begins and you can't stand up straight, you're going to know it. So I really don't want you taking out your stopwatch and saying, 30 seconds, I wonder if I should evacuate after this happens. Yeah, just, it'll be unmistakable. And for folks who may have moved here from California, our earthquakes are bigger, I need to tell you. And if you're in a high-rise building, stay away from those uh, walls of glass windows. So this is an image we showed just to try to get a, a graphic in your minds about the difference between a local and a distant tsunami. At the top, you can see the local tsunami again, generated by that energy right off our coast. The response is to drop cover, hold on, and get to high ground. And for a distant, across the Pacific, it's a very different response. We have uh, 
a lot more time to prepare. And the next slide kind of tells you how to do that. So I've talked about 15 to 20 minutes after the earthquake, evacuating on foot, having your bag of emergency supplies. In a distant tsunami, very different event, and that's why we're showing it on our maps. Our old maps only showed one evacuation zone. These show both the distant and the local. Because we get these distant tsunamis quite a bit more often than the local, and emergency responders, you know, we want to get this right and not have folks necessarily evacuate or over-evacuate when they don't have to. I guess two years ago when Japan's earthquake and tsunami happened, there were folks who drove clear to the Willamette Valley because they thought that was the only safe place to go. Uh, looking at the maps tonight, you'll see that that's, that's a slight over-evacuation, to say the least. Um, and if you're already outside the hazard zone, in the green spaces on the map, you can just stay there, have a cup of coffee, um, no need to go anywhere. In fact, we actually beg you, in the event of a tsunami, not to go down to the ocean to watch it come in. Just please don't do that. <coughs> Folks have done that before, and they've lost their lives. This happened two years ago in Northern California. It's very sad. Um, 